There's a cool story uh, by Terry Bison, I think, called uh, They're Made of Meat. And it's two aliens that suddenly realize that, you know, one, one of them is telling the other one that I, I found out what these what these humans are made of. They're, they're made of meat. And the other one's like that. That can't. I mean, there's no way that's that's that, that's just ridiculous. There's no there's no way you can get cognition out of meat. That's nonsense. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Pins and the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 187. And this episode is with Michael Levin who is a distinguished professor in the biology department at Tufts University, where he holds the Vannevar books and Doug Scher. Michael and the Levin Lab, as I will have told you the last time Michael was on the show, work at the intersection of biology, artificial life, bioengineering, synthetic morphology, cognitive science, and plenty of other things besides. And as I just mentioned, Michael was a guest on episode 151, which was all about synthetic life and collective intelligence. But in this tech, in this episode, we talk about the not at all unrelated topics of the nature of cognition, his joint work with the philosopher Daniel Dennett, how cognition can be realized by different structures and materials, how we ought to define robots. A new class of robot that him and his team, he and his team have developed called the Anthrobot, and whether or not we have moral obligations to biological robots like aforesaid Anthrobot. There is a Patreon that you can subscribe to. The link is in the subscription, and reviews, comments, likes, all those things are extremely helpful. And now, without any further ado. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having you, Michael. So in our last episode, we spoke a lot about intelligence, and that's exactly where I wanted to pick up especially since you recently came out with an article on sentience and cognition. And maybe the right place to start is with how you even think about these terms, because last time we talked, you told me about how important it is for definitions to promote rather than inhibit research. So how do you think of uh, sentience and cognition writ large in the first place? Yeah. So um, sentience is not particularly a term that I myself use a lot. So this is something that uh, mainly um, Nick Rouleau wanted to focus on for this for this paper. But, uh, you know, that's fine. Um, Your co-author. I, yeah, yeah the, exactly. The co yeah, my co-author. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I I talk a lot about cognition. And uh, for me, this is a spectrum that indicates what kind of interaction protocol you're going to use with a given system. So for me, any kind of claims about um, intelligence, agency, cognition, any of those things, what they really are are protocol claims about what the best way is to interact with a given system. So it's shorthand for a collection of tools and approaches that you might use. So this is this gets back to um, an illustration of the spectrum of persuadability that I show in that in my uh, tame paper from a couple of years ago, and the idea is that, and so in this in this uh, spectrum I show four basic. I mean there are, there are many more, but I show four basic waypoints. And uh, there are simple machines like mechanical clocks. And if you tell me that something is a simple machine like that, what you mean is that you're not going to reward it. You're not going to punish it. You're not going to convince it of anything. Uh, the, the, the only way you're going to change what it does is by physical hardware rewiring. Right. Uh, and then and then there are more interesting machines like thermostats. So these are the kinds of things that you might use the tools of cybernetics on. So these are things that have little uh, goals or maybe bigger goals, uh, depending on how sophisticated they are. They have set points. And one interesting way to manipulate that kind of system is to change the set point. Uh, that's 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 an interesting way of um, manipulating it, because if you're going to set the set point, as you do with your thermostat at home, you don't need to know everything about how it works. You don't need to rewire it. You just need to understand how it encodes that set point. And once you change that set point, then you can rely on the system to do what it does best, which is to try to manage things toward that set point, right? To reduce error towards that set point. So that's an interesting uh, kind of more advanced class of, uh, of agents. 
Um, then from there, you might think about um, agents that can learn. And so there you might be able to use uh, the tools of behavioral science. So you might to use rewards and punishments and, uh, and things like that. And then, then you run into uh, on the right side of that spectrum, extremely kind of advanced cognitive agents that let's say human level where you don't even directly use reward and punishment, but you use reasons. So you give them reasons to do things. And then you know that you're dealing with a system that will, because of its own commitments to logic, to various beliefs that it might have, will do certain things once you provide specific information and you don't have to micromanage it at all. So what happens on that spectrum is that uh, what 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 the degree and the type of cognition tells you is what can you do in interactions with that system? And of course, towards the left end of that spectrum, you're talking mostly about prediction and control. But towards the right end of that spectrum, you're getting into things like relationships where you're actually uh, enjoying the agency that the system has. You're not just trying to get it to do specific things. It's more of a back and forth dance. You're having an actual relationship as you might have with a human or some other, some other high level um, system that has metacognition and goals like yours and things like that. So, so that's what I think cognition is. I think uh, it's, it's uh, the science of understanding how systems make decisions, how they solve problems in their world. Another way to think about it is uh, and this becomes important when people say, well, you know, at the, at the lowest level of that spectrum, you get very minimal physical systems like rocks and things. And so what do you, what do you do there? And so I think to a large extent, what you're talking about on that spectrum is to what degree do you need to concern yourself with, um, the internal model that that system makes of the environment. And what I mean by that is if you have a bowling ball on a landscape, on, on a landscape of, of hills and valleys, all you need to do is think about what that landscape looks like to you. So your third person ob observation of that landscape, right? You, your vision of that landscape as an external observer tells the whole story. You, you know, from that landscape, you know exactly what's going to happen. There's not, there's not much else to it. On the other hand, if you have a mouse on a similar landscape, your view of that landscape isn't nearly as important as the mouse's view in terms of predicting what's going to happen. Because if the mouse has memories of being rewarded or punished or different valence about what's going on on that landscape, that's really what determines what happens. So it's not the physical landscape that you as an observer sees, but it's actually the internal representation of that landscape that that agent has. And that, that agent, it might be a mouse, it might be a Roomba, it might be a, you know, some other kind of self, you know, self um, driving robot, whatever it, it might be a cell, whatever it is, the degree to which you have to ask yourself what the internal first person perspective of the system is, tells you something very important about what kind of relationship you can have with it and the tools that you can use to the protocols that you can use to optimally interact with that system. So that's, that's what I think cognition is all about. That was an awesome start. I was going to wait to bring this up until later, but the second of your four categories, the one that involves thermostats, mm. it, when I hear thermostats, which is funny is something that would only happen with somebody who studies philosophy. The first thing that comes to my mind is, or the first person is Daniel Dennett, because mm -hmm. Daniel Dennett's chief example of an intentional system is the thermostat, which you can consider or think of as having goals, even though we don't typically think of thermostats when we're employing our, our theory of mind. And the reason that this is relevant is that I know that you two have worked together. And mm. is this one of the areas in which you've worked together? Or is were you more interested in evolutionary theory? Or what was your collaboration about? Yeah, um, well, Dan, Dan and I are, are friends, and we've uh, talked about uh, these issues, you know, a long time. Um, which is funny to say that now because I had him, you know, uh, I had him in a in a uh, philosophy of mind course when I was when I was in college. You know, he was a professor there, and uh, you know, of course, I was reading his books, and that's it's kind of still weird to me to to say that uh, you know he and I talk about these things, uh, so, you know. But um, <laughs> uh, we yeah we 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 wrote something we we wrote a piece uh, together that's uh, kind of about the scaling of of uh, intentionality in biology. And uh, we discuss all of these things, including, uh, you know, uh, f free will and decision making and all those kinds of things. Um, the example of the of the thermostat is really fundamental because the, the biggest issue and I think I think Dan agrees with us and he's done an amazing job um, uh, in his in his books of uh, 
using various examples to try to break this down for people. The, the biggest thing that stands in the way of a fruitful understanding of minds and cognition, and actually we have many other things in the, in the um, realm of ethics and, and so on, is uh, our innate desire for, binary, for, for crisp binary categories. So what happens when people say these things, and maybe they mean thermostats or maybe they mean something else, these things don't have, don't have real goals. I have real goals, right? I mean, that, that's, that kind of thing falls apart immediately when you ask yourself where you came from. You came from a single cell. And that cell came from a little um, collection of, from an unfertilized oocyte, a little collection of uh, chemicals. And, and if you think you have real goals, then you need to be able to tell a story about um, how a little blob of chemistry and physics slowly and gradually during embryonic development acquired the capacity for real goals. And it used to be, you know, you know prior to the 40s, let's say, um, it used to be not at all clear uh, how it is that quote unquote machines and and this is this is another very contentious uh, term um, that people throw around as to what machines are but uh, it used to be not obvious at all how, how it could be that a machine has goals of course it was also not at all obvious how any kind of living organism could have goals either but if we but 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 then we had um, cybernetics which uh, really laid out for the first time a very clear quantitative, theory of what goals are and how they scale and something like that homeostatic loop that a simple thermostat embodies so take a measurement compare it to a set point and then act to reduce the error that as a, as a little kind of atomic um little basal uh kind of proto goal uh that's that's the start of it that that's it right there once once you have that once you have that homeostatic loop then you can start to study how they scale up and what it is we mean when we say when we have metacognitive goals when we say i know that i have a goal you know a thermostat has a first order goals it does not it, it does not know that it has goals it just has goals so it's it's really important uh uh to to understand that all, pretty much all of the terms that we use i am not aware of really very many binary terms at all all the terminology that we use is is continuous and uh and if you think you as a human have some sort of property then there's a spectrum and a and a gradient and eventually it sort of peters out in extremely minimal examples but it's all smooth and continuous Hmm. Yeah, I think that this is one of the main roadblocks that people come to in digesting this sort of information, because we have this preconceived notion that cognition is something that only things with brains do. Hmm. And it's hard to imagine, or it just doesn't work with our definition of cognition to think of simple simple machines like pulleys or levers or thermostats as doing anything like cognition and maybe this is where gatekeeping in definitions comes in i'm wondering what you think some of the main gatekeeping definitions of cognition are and then how yours sort of builds upon that to promote research yeah um you know, it's 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 fine to have terms for specific things that you're interested in. So so if if you study advanced human level metacognition, it's it's okay to have a word for what it is that you do. For the same reason that you know, I often argue with people when they say, "Well, well this is a neuron." I say, "Well, what's a neuron exactly?" Right? Most cells do what what neurons do, just you know, uh, in, in slow, more more slowly. But you know, when you're studying uh, neuroanatomy 101, that's not the time to, to to have a debate about what neurons are. Everybody in the class should know what they mean, and and it's, and and that's okay. But but more fundamentally, uh, it, it is essential to understand that these terms do not have useful sharp delimiters. And there's two there's two ways that you can sort of convince yourself that that's that that's true. On the one hand, uh, all you need to do is try to trace it back to the time that you were a single cell. You can do that either during development or during evolution. But inevitably, um, if you believe you have some sort of cognitive property, just ask yourself, well, where do you think that peters out? 
And usually, you know, oftentimes people will say, well, when the brain shows up, well, that's a very long process. And they'll say, okay, fine. You know, when this, when, you know, when the, when the cortex appears or something, say, yeah, that, that, that takes days and weeks. Uh, What's happening during that, during that process? When does it sort of wink into existence? And, and there is no, there is no sharp story to, to tell about any of this. Um, Likewise, you know, with brains, uh, I mean, science fiction dealt with this, you know, many decades, you know, probably well over a hundred years ago. Um, yeah, and the, there's a cool, there's a cool story uh, by Terry Bison, I think, called the, "They're Made of Meat," and it's two aliens that suddenly realize that, you know, one, one of them is telling the other one that I, I found out what these what these humans are made of. They're they're made of meat, and the other one's like that that can't. I mean, there's no way. That's that's that that's just ridiculous. There's no there's no way you can get cognition out of meat. That's nonsense. And right, and you can just imagine, you know, our our um uh our, our preference you know our preference for this particular embodiment i mean what are you going to do when if 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 and when we discover life elsewhere and it's uh, made of completely different principles you're really going to say that that just because they don't have a brain architecture like ours that that's not real cognition i mean that seems ridiculous to me and um i i think we really need to we, we really need to understand uh what what is fundamental about uh the the, the terms that we use and and uh, uh, our, our, our smooth and continuous history with the abiotic world tells us that these things have to scale gradually. Yes, I mean, yes, of course, there can be, um, you know, some phase transitions and so on, but, but all of this scales, scales gradually. The, the other and, and, and maybe more um, in the end, kind of uh, more, more forceful uh, argument is, is simply this. What does... What, the, what, what are the consequences of this kind of gatekeeping? So, so I'll give you a simple example. Um, gene regulatory networks. Gene regulatory networks are are, are a computational model of, of genes interacting with each other, and the you know so so it's a it's a collection of let's say ten nodes. One you know each one is a gene, and then you draw little arrows, and they turn each other on and off, and and you've got this model, and and these things control development and and physiology and health and disease and, and a million other things. So you look at this thing, and um, if 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 you're into cognitive gatekeeping, you would say. Okay, look, this is a deterministic, uh, very simple system. I can see all the interactions. It's it's a mechanic. It's it's a mechanism. It's a machine. There's no there's no uh, there's, there's there's nothing here that you could use to say that it's that it has cognition. That has now now that now having um, having said that, having done no experiments for on to, to to show that by the way, just having this opinion, which which often people do, um, th what that does is is uh, prevent you from making further discoveries. The discoveries that you might make, as as we did a couple of years ago, is to say, well, actually, what if we don't know what the cognitive um, properties of this thing are? We we don't really know where on the spectrum of cognition it fits. Let's find out. Let's do an experiment. And what you can do is you can say, okay, what if uh, what if I try some tools from uh, from behavioral science? What if I try training it? If you try training it by stimulating the various nodes and and to see what happens to the other nodes, you find out that it actually has. Uh, six different kinds of memory, including Pavlovian conditioning. And so it turns out you can train it. Who knows what else, you know, we haven't finished the, that investigation. For, for all I know, it may do uh, lots of other interesting um, sort of protocognitive things. But the point is that once you've discovered that, now all kinds of interesting therapeutic modalities become possible because it means that the way to change what it does is not just the traditional uh, rewiring, which is which is if you think it's a machine and it has it's not on the spectrum of cognition, then your your only options for for changing its behavior are you add nodes, you remove nodes, you change the in, the um, the links between the nodes, right? So so gene therapy and 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 um, uh, promoter uh, promoter modification and things like that. Uh, so the hardware. But it turns out that uh, that if if you're willing to do the experiment, you find out that actually no, they have these. Um, they're trainable. They can be trained, which means that uh, trains of specific kinds of stimuli will get the network to permanently change its behavior. That's memory, right? Changing future behavior on the basis of past experience. And it turns out that you don't actually need to change the hardware uh, in order to change its behavior, because like many computational systems, it learns from experience. And so that offers all kinds of new uh, therapeutic uh, um, potential therapeutic roadmaps, where the way you're going to control all of these pathways is by uh, stimulating them with, with, you know, in some uh, in some fashion that you derive using the tools of behavioral science. So there, it's it's very simple. If if you make assumptions because you want to gatekeep this terminology, you are closed out of certain discoveries and certain um, new uh, 
new new approaches to to standing problems. And if you're willing to take these things as empirical matters, then you would do an experiment and you you would find out which of the tools of cognitive science are actually appropriate. And then, mm. and then you have new new opportunities for research, and so and so that's what I th that's what I think the bottom line for all of this is, uh, if if somebody has an opinion about about the term about ter the terminology use or about certain systems, my question is always the same. That's great. What has that framework let you discover? And and then we find out, um, you know, how what what whether we like that opinion or not. Mm. I'd like to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, which was that sentience isn't a term that you use so much as it is something that your co-author, Nicholas Rouleau, likes to use. And I think that asking why you don't use it will lead to something interesting, maybe. And my hunch is that, so you said you laid out these four categories, ranging from the simple machines to the systems that learn from reasons. And you said that other than persuadability, I mean, one thing that where something is on the hierarchy tells you is to what extent you need to be concerned with the way the system is modeling its environment. Mm -hmm. And something that I've gotten from talking with people like uh, Dennett or Michael Graziano at, at Princeton is, or Joseph Ledeau, at NYU is that the more advanced a system is, the more it models. And as things get toward this fourth level on the hierarchy, they might begin self-modeling. So that's something where maybe language is very important or communicating with others. We have to be aware of what we're thinking, what we're revealing, what we're not revealing. And I'm wondering if this is where you think sentience would fit in self-modeling and if also if you're not as interested in this because the focus of your research is more on agents lower in this hierarchy like slime molds or anthrobots or xenobots or things that aren't self-modeling well uh i i, I would say this i I, th I think that uh looking for self-modeling as a property of uh, brainy uh, brainy animals is way too late so so I think I think cells self-model and I think that um, Chris fields and Carl Friston have uh, v very sophisticated uh, views of um, uh, aspects of, of, of physics where you can look at that capacity even in uh, very very um, kind of minimal physical systems that we wouldn't even call alive. So I think uh, I think just by itself making a model of yourself is not that hard. It certainly doesn't require being a mammal or having a you know a complex brain or anything like that. Um, you you know we could we could we can easily put together a uh, a kind of. Uh, you know, a thermostat that in addition to measuring the room temperature also has a metacognitive loop where it measures its own state. In fact, in fact, bacteria um, me measure okay. their own metabolism to uh, to have an idea of how are things going for me nowadays, you know. Um, now, now what you do have in advanced creatures is uh, a, a special kind of metacognition where they know that they know Right. And that's that's yet a more complex thing. But I think sentience in the way that Nick defines it, which I think I think is perfectly good, which is, uh, you, you know, he calls it the capacity for subjective experience. If if you take as subjective experience and again, I'm not I'm not specifically um, getting into the um, kind of uh, the, the, the swamp uh, lands of uh, talking about consciousness, per se, because I think that's a whole other a whole other issue. But in terms of fun functionally, in terms of looking at a system that has a unique subjective experience in the sense that it has a different perspective on the world than you as a third person observer do. It has its own memories, its own uh, uh, perspective on the world. It has uh, its, uh, its, its, its own valence about things and so on. I think that happens very early on. And um, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not avoiding the term. It's just, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think I think I think I think you already get that by the time that um, you're talking about systems that have a perspective that you need to grapple with, and that that can be a very 
you know, ask, asking, I mean, look, you know, um, Randy Beer once asked, what does the world look like from the perspective of a glider in the game of life? You know, the, the, the self-perpetuating um, kind of uh, uh, almost a persistent physiological pattern, it's not even an object. And what does the world look like from that, from that perspective? Um, already there's a minimal uh, perspective there. So, so yeah, I think that that's, that's what I like. I, I like asking the question of what, what the world looks like from the viewpoint of different agents to the degree that we can, we can try to understand it. Mm. Now the, the title of this paper is the multiple realizability of sentience in living systems and beyond, but you don't just tackle the multiple realizability of sentience, but the multiple realizability of cognition. And I'm wondering if the multiple realizability of cognition just means for you that, well, you'll tell me what it means, but if it means that the same sorts of modeling and problem solving and decision making can be made not just by different structures of the same kind. So for instance, if one area of the brain is damaged, another area might start solving those same problems, but whether it's also substrate independence. So this goes back to your story from that short story about, uh, humans being made of meat and that being very surprising. Yeah. 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 I think, I, 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 th I think it's, uh, just, uh, completely untenable that our brain architecture is the only way that you can do real cognition. And, um, I think that it's really important for technology, for engineering, for biomedicine, but also for ethics and for human flourishing uh, into the and, and maturing as a, as a species into the uh, decades beyond that we really get to some principled frameworks for how we're going to relate to uh, other beings that are radically different from ourselves. It used to be that if you ask the question, what do you look like and how did you get here? You know, right. Origin, origin and composition. You could pretty well determine how you're going to relate to something. So you'd sort of knock on it. And, and if you hear this metallic clangy sound and you know, it was made in a factory, then that tells you all you need to know. It's going to be rather boring. Uh, it has no, um, you know, moral rights. So you can do whatever you want, take it apart, do do whatever. And conversely, uh, if you, if you, if you tap on it and you hear this, like, uh, you know, a uh, warm sort of soft thud, uh, and, and you know, this was a natural product of evolution, then you know, and, and, and by the way, humans aren't particularly good at this, but at least in theory, you know, that you should be nice to it. And, uh, and, and it has, uh, you know, uh, so, so it, it shares some capacity to suffer with you and so on. Uh, th th those categories were, I mean, they were never good. They were um, okay heuristics at a time when our limited understanding and, and very limited imagination kind of uh, let us live in a world where, where um, the only things that, uh, that, that share those important properties with us were, were things that are on the evolutionary tree with us. That's no longer the case. Um, and, and we, we knew, and, and, you know, people who uh, write science fiction knew for a long time that, the, that that wasn't always going to be the case. And you can imagine, uh, of course, even, even before you get to really weird, new embodiments for things that were going to be um, around us in the future, you know, so, so high brats and synthetic life forms and embodied AIs and robotics and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And even in the absence of aliens and so on, you can, you can already realize that that spectrum of multiple realizability, realizability, start with, start with um, humans that are neurodivergent. Right. So 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 now we kind of understand that, OK, we have this this idea of neurodivergence and not everybody sees the world the way we do. Not everybody processes information the, the way that we think uh, each of us does. Uh, and there are different ways of, of, of being. And then you say, well, OK, so so that's kind of natural neurodivergency. And then and then pretty soon, in fact, we already have people with various kind of brain implants and some of these are passive things and pretty soon we'll have active ones that have a little bit of AI and are uh, making some decisions about when to release certain neurotransmitters to, to give you a better experience, whether for therapeutics or augmentation or whatever. And so there you have somebody that's maybe 98% human and 2% something else. And then those percentages are going to slide, right? Because, because inevitably 
as we understand more about uh, how 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 our our bodies work and our brains work and the technology proceeds, we're going to be able to connect into uh, expand ourselves. We're going to have agential prosthetics. We're going to be able to connect uh, to other humans. We're going to be able to connect to uh, other non-human systems. Uh, expand our, our cognition in various ways. That's both technological and biological. And things are going to get rapidly weirder and weirder all the way to what I like to think about as, as freedom of embodiment. You know, you should have whatever kind of mind and body you want, ultimately. And so, and so that means we really have to get beyond this, this idea that uh, only the only morally important things are ones that look like us and came from the same place we came from. And this is, I, I hope everybody recognizes this is, this is uh, th this idea that, that um, you, you know, you can't decide how you're going to um, treat others based on what they look like and, and where they came from. Like that's not a crazy, you know, sort of new uh, idea that I'm, that I'm proposing here. This is, this is fundamentally where, where we've been going for a long time. We just have to realize the implications are a lot more radical than people think. And I think in the future, the extremely um, minor differences that we currently fight over uh, are going to be considered just ridiculous in the in the um, you know in the grand spectrum of, of of things that are that are coming and what what the mature you know the mature um, beings of the future are going to look back and say they argued over what it's I mean it's just going to be laughable. Hmm. Well, I'd like to put up a flag so that we can come back to these other ways of cognizing beyond having a human brain but since you meant since you mentioned uh high brats and all these other sorts of bots and then you also there was also another key word that jumped out at me which was uh moral uh maybe moral importance but i wanted to jump into an example and you just had a paper come out recently about a new sort of bot that we didn't talk about last time in september and that is the the anthrobot mm -hmm. what's the anthrobot <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so I'll tell you what it is. Uh, just to be clear, um, we have not yet made any claims about where these bots sit on the spectrum of cognition, um, and, uh, and 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 the reason is is because you you can't just. Um, have feelings or pre-commitments about these things. You have to do experiments, and those experiments are still underway. So, what we've shown is um, you might you might remember the Xenobots, which which uh, we created. Um, uh, a few years ago, and and those were made of frog cells, and these are basically the idea of uh, uh, liberating some number of epithelial cells from a frog embryo, and they will uh, re uh, sort of reaggregate into a into a, a self motile little structure, which which we, which is among other things a biorobotics platform, so we call it a xenobot. So and and then it has certain um, certain behaviors and and, and properties and so on. Um, one of the things that uh, some people said at the time was, well, we know amphibians are plastic. We know embryos are plastic. So the fact that these cells are doing these interesting things, uh, the, it, what if it's a... Um, uh, well, well, it's 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 a one-off result. It's it's a frog embryo. In fact, in fact, people people said. Uh, why do you need a new term xenobot? These look like animal caps. Animal caps are is something that uh, developmental biologists who study frogs have been uh, s seeing for a long time. It's the ectoderm from a frog uh, embryo that is uh, once you take it off the embryo is able to differentiate into different things and it's ciliated and it sort of wiggles around and so on. And so this is just a, this is an animal cap. You don't you don't need another word. But that's that's the power of uh, of terminology here in terms of facilitating or preventing future work. Because if you think of this as a frog specific thing and you call it a uh, you call it a, uh, a an animal cap, what you're not going to do is try to do the same thing from human cells. And that's exactly what we did. And that's because we wanted to. So I wanted to show an example of something that isn't embryonic. It isn't amphibian. It has, it's, it has nothing to do with being an animal cap. It is a more fundamental uh, capacity of cells with a perfectly normal genome to do new things. And so, so we went as far away from, uh, from the frog. And so, uh, and so what, what we wanted to do was, uh, uh, see see how much of that plasticity uh was was generic and 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 went beyond what embryonic cells and um and 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 frog cells uh, could do and so this is uh this is a new um uh, a new paper uh the first author is Gizem Gumushkaya who's a PhD student in my group and then a whole other um there there are many uh, other people on that on that team lots of lots of folks who uh, who participated in that in that research and so what what we what we did was to take 
uh, uh, lung epithelium cells from human patients. And these are adults. In fact, most of the time they're fairly el elderly adults. Um, and we take these cells and there's a particular process that um, gives them, puts them through. And at the end, they uh, become basically, they look a lot like a xenobot in the sense that they are this, these spherical things with cilia on the outside. And they use those cilia to row against the, the, flu the fluid, the medium that they're in. And they move around and they have different interesting behaviors. They have different... Um, uh, uh, classes of shapes that they can make. And then maybe the most uh, kind of bombshell result in that paper at the end is that if you put them on top of um, a layer of human peripheral nerve, um, and then that you've put a scratch through, right? So, so, you, so you make a monolayer of neural cells in, in culture, you take a scalp and you just scratch, put a scratch through it. It's, you know, it's a simple model of wound healing, you know, these, these scratch, um, so scratch wound cultures. Um, if you put the if you, if you put the anthrobots there, what they will do is settle down in a particular location across that scratch, and four or so days later, if you pick them up, what you'll see is that underneath what they've done is they've taken the two sides of the wound and they've healed it together, so that there's now a bridge, the neuronal bridge that that connects where roughly where they were sitting, and so so this idea, you know, and so 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 I love it because these are these are um, standard cells with uh, their, their standard adult cells with a normal human genome. If you see, um, you know, I'm starting to do talks on this. And when I do the talks, I normally show this little thing running around and doing its thing. And I ask people, what do you think this is? Right. It looks like something you got out of a pond somewhere, you know, some sort of primitive organism. And then I say, well, we've, we, we know what the genome looks like and uh, the genome is actually homo sapiens. Uh, and, and this idea that your tracheal cells are sitting there quietly for your whole lifetime, and then if they were given a chance to uh, reboot their multicellularity, they could actually repair your neural cells and who knows what else. I mean, we're going to test a million other things. That was just the first thing we, we tested, uh, right? Like who knew they could do that? You know, it's, 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 it's an amazing thing. And, and once you never find out, and if you, and if you, and if you think of these things as one-off results or as, you know, animal caps or anything like that, you don't, you, you're not motivated to do the next experiment. And that's, that's the, the power of, um, conceptual unifying conceptual frameworks that say, you know, there's something fundamental here. Um, and that's, and that's what these anthrobots are. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm making no claims whatsoever about where these anthrobots are on the spectrum of cognition, but we're certainly going to find out. And we're doing that with Xenobots too. We're asking these questions, are they trainable? Do they learn if they, so if they learn what kinds of paradigms can they be trained in? Uh, do they have preferences? Do they, what, what other behaviors do they have? No, none of this is obvious any more than knowing that actually, um, given the opportunity, they could go out and heal, uh, de defects in peripheral innervation any more than that's obvious. These are all things that we have to discover. We're not, we're not good at, um, predicting them from scratch. Mm. One of the things that I, I love about you and your work in your lab, I was telling a friend of mine after our first conversation to listen to the episode and it's that you are as close to a mad scientist as yeah. I've I've come in in looking at anybody's research, but in a great way, uh, and it's very cool uh, hearing about every experiment, every paper you write. It's always really neat. Uh, oh, so well, thank you, thank you. I, yeah, so thank I, I mean, I, I agree. I'll I'll take it. Uh, but you know, mad scientist is 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 fine. Um, the part of it, the part of it, I I enjoy and lean into is the idea that all of the interesting stuff for me is around the bound the boundaries of things that we didn't think were possible of the were places where we thought uh specific theories don't extend to um you know in in particular uh plasticity and and cognition in surprising places um all of that leads to breaking expectations and that that's the part that looks really uh crazy to you know to people after after the fact you know after after the fact um you can you can always come up with with explanations for these things, but but the question is, what kind of theory got you to do the experiment in the first place? And in my group, that's one of the things I love the most about my lab and and the people in it is that uh, we do a lot of experiments that seem at first seem crazy and um, and uh, seem like a counter expectation. And you know, and everybody in in the lab knows that you know the wilder uh, the idea, the you know the the happier I am to to hear it. I I, I don't squash these things. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll take that I'll take that part. Hmm. Well, before we get back to the Anthrobot paper, I think you said at the outset that Xenobots were a bio robotics platform, and mm -hmm. 
what I wanted to ask was just what the bot suffix means to you. Since mm -hmm. most people think of bots and here's another uh, maybe gatekeeping notion as something involving metal nuts and, and bolts. But so what makes something a bot? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. And this is something that uh, my collaborator, Josh Bongard and I, who, who's, he's, he's an actual roboticist. Um, we, we talk about a, a lot and actually it was, it was very funny uh, when, when the first um, Xenobot paper came out, a lot of biologists uh, came out and said, that's not a robot. And, and, you know, and, and Josh Bongard, who's an actual roboticist, you know, was, was on the paper and he's like, no, that's pretty much a robot. Uh, and, and that's, and that's because different, different people use words differently, but okay. So, so let's think about, um, uh, let's, let's think about what, what, what a useful sense of, of robotics is. I think that there, there is, there's a, there's a growing field of uh, soft body robotics and, and uh, robotics made out of all kinds of unconventional materials. I mean, people have made robots out of pine cones and, and uh, just, you know, you name it. Out of, so the, the material doesn't matter. What, what I think is important about being a robot is that some other uh, external agent is capitalizing on the architecture, the control architecture of a system to get it to do what they want it to do. So, so um, we, 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 let, me, let me back up one, one, one other thing. Uh, when people ask, is it, is it a robot? Is it a living thing? Is it an organism? What they're looking for is one clear assignment. They, they want it to be in one category and they want it to be there. They want there to be an objective answer. That is what this thing is. And if, and if you're using a different term, you're wrong. So I think, I think that is a completely misguided um, approach. I think that's never going to work. These things are everything. They are, a, they are obviously a living thing. They are a kind of proto organism. They're not the full organism for reasons that we can discuss. Uh, they are also a robotics platform. And the reason you can be many things at once is because all of this is relative to how it's a lens of that, that how you are um, observe, going to interact with that system. So, so if you interact with something as if it were a robot, what you're saying is, I'm going to figure out what the control architecture of the system is, and then I'm going to exploit that control architecture to get it to do certain things. If you are saying, uh, no, no, uh, I want to, I want to ex um, uh, uh, treat it as a uh, you know, as a, as a majestic living being full of hopes and dreams, you could do that too. That's great. And, and, and there, when you're dealing with a system that has that high level of agency, your goal is not to exert your control via um, its interface. Your goal is to, in some way, enrich both of you by uh, having this, uh, this relationship with its, uh, with its agency. Both of those things can be true depending on what, what, what system you're, you're looking at and what your, your goals are. So I call, I call Xenobots a, uh, a biorobotics platform because I think it's a very rich system for learning to program form and function. And so ultimately, when you want little uh, biodegradable, safe, um, non-mutant, non, non genetically modified li living machines that are going to go out and clean up the environment, or, or in the case of anthrobots, they're going to um, clean your arteries or, or get rid of cancer cells or uh, I don't know, uh, uh, fix uh, the defects in your spinal cord or your retina. That is a biorobotics platform because in that sense, what you're, do, what, you, what you're hoping to do is to learn to program that system, control that system to do exactly what you want it to do. Side by side, there will be another project asking, well, what do they want to do? What are their native behaviors? What are, you know, what are their native preferences? And, and that's, that is, you know, and what, and, and what are their cognitive capacities? What can they, what can they learn and so on? And that's, that's a different, that's a different um, research program. And both, both are valid. Uh, in medicine, um, when I, when I give talks on, uh, on the future of regenerative medicine, you know, sometimes we get into this question of is, uh, you know, is, is the body a machine or, and, and it's funny because, because I, I'll sometimes get angry letters from both sides, right? So I'll get, I'll get people who are really into um, mechanisms and um, kind of a, a bottom up kind of engineering. And they'll say, look, these are, you know, you're, you're, you're misusing the, the, all of the, the, these things are, you shouldn't be using cognitive terms. There's no goals. There's no memory. There's no cognition. These are simple. These are machines and we should treat them as machines. And then conversely, I'll get, um, uh, I'll get uh, emails from, uh, from people in the organicist tradition, which by the way, I consider uh, myself as well, uh, who will say you, you're, you're undoing, the battle that we've been fighting against living things being treated as simple machines. Why do you talk about them as, as having software, as reprogramming, as to use, you know, these things are not bots, they're living, living creatures. 
all of that is true. It, it has to do with what your perspective is for what you want to do. And, and um, I, I, have this, I have this slide when I, uh, when I talk about this in medicine, wh whether the human body is a machine. The first slide is what orthopedic surgery looks like. And it's uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this guy actually sent me a picture of uh, taken during surgery of, of his arm. So you can imagine it's, pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty shocking picture. It's, 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 it's this guy's arm. It's, it's opened up completely in half. Um, and, and the orthopedic surgeon who's got a mallet and a drill and a chisel and some, you know, some, some screws and he's going at it. And you can bet that the tools, uh, both conceptually and practically, the tools that he's using are he's exploiting the body as a machine. He knows all about the, the mechanical advantage and the, and the adhesive properties of the different um, uh, materials that he's using and, and the stresses that that limb is going to be under. And, and what enables all of that to work is a, is a lens that views that system as a machine. And it's really good that, that we have that. However, after all that is done, what happens after that? Then after that, after they close you up, they send you home to heal. And when they send you home to heal, now the other doctors are taking advantage of all the other stuff that your body does, which is not at all a simple machine, which is to uh, be able to um, uh, repair and reach certain set points, despite the fact that you now have a bunch of titanium in your arm and, and all of these things are, are different and so on. And of course, there are aspects of medicine that do not treat you as a simple machine, but are uh, increasingly recognizing all the intelligence of the materials all the way through to the very edge of that spectrum, which is the therapy you, you, you may have at some point, which, um, you know, sort of dives into how you feel about your accident and, and what that means for your greater, you know, sort of your greater life and all that. So all of those levels ex coexist at the same time. Hmm. Just to test to make sure that I have some of the implications of your definition of robot right, where something's a robot if something else is capitalizing on its, I think you said capitalizing on its control architecture to get it to do mm -hmm. what it wants. So what comes to mind when I hear this definition is the the cordyceps fungus that goes into an ant's mm -hmm. brain and then gets the ant to climb high and then it sprouts from its brain and shoots out yeah. spores in your framework then does the ant sort of become a robot for the cordyceps mushroom or fungus y yes and and moreover the 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 only reason that whole interaction is even possible is because it was a potential robot in the first place, because it had a control control architecture that could be hijacked in that way. If 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 um, if you are impervious to being hijacked, you're probably a rock. You know, and any <laughs> any any functional agent is going to have a causal architecture that it uses to control itself, and that means you are potentially susceptible to hacking. If you're not susceptible to being hacked by something else, you are probably an incredibly simple machine. And and the fact that that ant was uh, didn't uh, operate by magic, it didn't operate by randomness. It operated by a um, a lawful architecture subject to the laws of computation and physics is what allowed some other agent, in this case the unwitting fungus, which also does its thing, not realizing what it's doing, as as Dennett says, a competence without comprehension. Uh, that, that's what allows this whole thing to happen because there are aspects of each of our lives that are, um, potential ro potentially robot like, and, um, you know, I, am not, I'm not, not an expert in, um, the, 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 you know, ergonomics of appliance design or anything like that, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, there are numerous aspects of our, of our cars, our kitchen appliances and so on that are, um, when people, uh, design these things, they are thinking, Okay, I don't know why, but our, our, our human clients always seem to do this. Uh, and this is something that the, how they always, you know, end up doing it wrong or they hurt themselves or whatever. We're going to make this uh, handle shaped a different way or we're going to put it over here where it's less like that. That's the robotic part. That's the part that uh, is not because the human has deep um, hopes and dreams of the future, but it's it, it's an aspect of our control architecture that you can reliably count on. And I think there are many things we do like that, that are very automatized that um, for good or for ill, other people can take advantage of, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that happens in, in the ergonomic design and it happens in uh, uh, various other scenarios uh, where we seek to control human behavior. There are, there are many aspects 
of our behaviors that are basically, uh, you know, on autopilot. And, and that's the robotic aspect of it. It's not the whole thing, but, but, but it's there, you know? Hmm. Again, I think that we need to keep in mind, and you, you've put this in, in different words, that a word like robot is not something that God introduced and defined and gave a canonical definition, and it's our job to sort of find it. The words serve us, and, and we made them. Yeah. But the two components that I think figure into a naive or, or common sense definition of robot are that it has some degree of mobility. And then the other is that maybe some other agent assembled it. And I'm wondering if, th do you, do you agree that the, these are at least common figure into our common sense understanding of robots, but then it also seems like you don't think that they're, they're useful. Uh, yeah. for how you define robot. Yeah, I think uh, I, I I agree with you that uh, it's entirely, po I mean, I don't know, I don't take polls on these things, but it's entirely possible that that's how people commonly think about them. I think as, as scientists and philosophers, it's our job to uh, gently uh, or not so gently push for better terminology um, or better use of the terminology. And so I'll say uh, this idea that robots are assembled by someone else uh, that's not going to survive the next few years because we already have self-assembling um, architectures of different types. And I think if you ask the next generation of, uh, you know, um, people who are children now, and, and, you know, if you ask them in 20 years, are all robots put together by, by other humans, they'll laugh. I mean, of course not. Of course, robots put together are the robots put robots put themselves together. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's really hard for people to visualize that complex things can put themselves together. We, we used to think that somebody else put us together, right? Before, before we, before we, we had a good grasp on, on embry embryogenesis and evolution, it was, it was unthinkable that something as complex as us uh, wasn't made by somebody else that was as smart as us, you know, and, and that, of course, leads to infinite regress and so on. Um, it's, it's, it has to be that complex things can arise without some increasingly complex thing being there first to, to put them together. So, so, so that, that is going to go away, you know, and as, as Chris Field says, uh, only technologies settle arguments like that, that's going to be in the next few years that, that that's going to go out the window because it'll be perfectly obvious to people that, that robots don't have to be put together by humans. Um, the other thing, the, the, the other thing is a little more subtle. Uh, the capacity for movement is interesting. But I want to make a, tw a twist here, which I think is really important, which is the same thing that when, when people argue about embodiment and, and some people say, you know, a purely software agent uh, cannot be a real agent, you need embodiment, you know, and there's a whole field of, of, um, of, of uh, embodied, uh, you know, embodied cognition, embodied robotics and so on. That's, you, know, you need a body with which to grapple with the real world, right, to have a proper mind. I 100% agree with that. However, uh, they always assume that um, the body has to be a physical body that moves through <clears throat> familiar three-dimensional space. And I, and I don't think that's the case. I think uh, agents live and, and um, pursue goals and suffer in other spaces. And that includes uh, the, the collective intelligence of your cells during development as it moves through anatomical morphospace. space. It includes your body organs, which are constantly moving through uh, physiological state spaces, all of your cells, which are moving through a high dimensional transcriptional state space. All of these spaces are as real to these agents as this three dimensional world is to us. And the only reason it feels real to us is because we happen to have sense organs like eyes and so on that look outward into this space. I think that if we had evolved with a sense of blood, of our own blood chemistry, imagine if we, for whatever reason, had like almost like a tongue kind of thing, but, but it faced inwards and you could, you could, you could feel 20 different parameters of your, of your blood chemistry. I think we would then feel intuitively that we live in a 23 dimensional hybrid space that par is partially physical and partially um, physiological. I think we would have no trouble recognizing that our liver and our kidneys were uh, uh, in, intelligent agents that navigate that space, that move around in that space. Um, I think will insulin pumps that are there to uh, 
return you to a good region of physiological space when you wandered off of it um, uh, are absolutely robots. They, are, they don't move in, in physical space, but they make decisions and they behave and we have harnessed them to do useful work in physiological space. So I think smart uh, Im implants like insulin pumps and other things that people get are absolutely robots because we have exploited their control architecture to help us navigate a space and they move. It's just not in three dimensional space. So I think, you know, I, I think we really have to, in all of these things, uh, the message is let's get beyond our superficial um, blinders, uh, our, our, our goggles that we've had on. And partly that's evolutionary, partly that's our, our history. We are not good at recognizing other problem spaces. We're not good at recognizing intelligence in other embodiments. We're not good at recognizing agents that are either much bigger than us or much smaller than us or much faster or much slower. Um, you know, these are all things we're going to have to learn to to recognize. And that means expanding our terminology and not letting our terms hold us back. You know, if we if we have these uh, if we try if we try to maintain these these sharp categories for concepts that were invented long before we really had any, you know, sufficient technology to speak of, um, we're going to really hold ourselves back in, in, in many important ways. Hmm. So speaking of that, that second component I mentioned, uh, mobility, I'd like to get back to the anthrobots now. And I think the, the first three words of your paper are motile living biobots. So motile yeah. is, is key. And did you say that when the anthrobot is placed on this scratch on a nerve cell, it, it stays there. It doesn't move across the scratch. What it will do is, um, uh, they, they tend to, they, they tend to, and we have videos attached to that paper where they, they basically drive down the scratch. And okay. if you, so, so they drive down the scratch and then what we'll do is, um, uh, because the scratch is bigger than any one bot, we will let them assemble into uh, something that um, Gizem calls uh, uh, super bots or bridge bots. And so they sort of assemble together and then they sit down in one particular area and that's where they do their thing. Now, look, I, I, I want to be super clear. We have not yet characterized, can they tell they're sitting on top of nerve? We don't know. Um, do they prefer to be in one location rather than another? We don't know. How much of that navigation is random walk exploration versus targeted motion? We don't know. These are all empirical questions. This is, not, you know, people are, but just like with Xenobots, people have these amazing debates about, look, they know what they're doing or now they're just random walking. And I keep saying, you can't, you can't guess that from watching videos of things happening. You have to do perturbative experiments and we're in the process of doing that. So, uh, you know, it's very tempting to look at these things and then to say, you know, people people who want to minimize it, they say, ah, that's just, you know, if you wander around long enough, you'll do X, Y, Z. And other people say, no, I can see, look, it, it, it's going from here to there. N none of that can be derived from purely observational video. So, so the next uh, few papers are going to be around asking those questions. What do they sense? What, what are the control? What's the control architecture? What do they care about? What are they uh, minimizing, maximizing, and so on? These are all experimental questions. Okay, so then I'm guessing the answer to this is no, but so at this point, do you, or maybe I should just say, so at this point you have, you don't really know why they are healing things or what sort of uh, problems they're trying to solve. You've just observed this behavior and don't correct, have correct. We, we correct. We we don't we don't know. And and it's even it's even formally possible that the causality goes the other way, and it's the neurons that are actually using the bot. Right. It could be. It could turn out that um, the neurons have way more agency in that interaction than we think, and that they are somehow attracting the bot and using it as a scaffold for information signals or something. Uh, you know, these are all these are all possible hypotheses that we're going to have to untangle. Oh, so so the ner the neurons alive. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So where is this being done in a petri dish? Correct. Yeah, it's in vitro. It's in a petri dish. Yeah. Okay, a human neuron. Correct. Yep. How do you get it? Uh, these are IPS derived, so these are um, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons. So they were reprogrammed from some uh, probably fibroblasts, I think, and turned into neurons, and then they proliferate and they make this whole like lawn lawn of living neurons, and then you and then you scratch it. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, 
at this point, you don't want to make any claims about where it sits in this cognitive hierarchy. But earlier, you mentioned that these new biobots, hybrid, xenobots, anthrobots, they do raise important moral questions. And maybe because we don't know where anthrobots are, we don't want to talk about whether they specifically uh, or whether you have answers to the moral questions when they pertain to anthrobots. But how do you think about moral obligations to creatures on this cognitive spectrum? Yeah. Um, uh, okay. A few, a few things. Uh, and then I think, I think a lot about this stuff uh, for obvious reasons. A um, couple of things. One is that baseline, I think that we have um, an, an obvious, I mean, there are a few things that are obvious here, but, but, but one thing that I think is absolutely clear is that we have a very strong uh, moral imperative to reduce the amount of biomedical suffering in the world. And the, uh, I mean, if you, if you could see, I'm not even a clinician, but if you could see the uh, stories that people email me every day, pictures, photographs, medical records, I mean, you, you, it, it, it is unbelievable what's going on out there with, with, uh, with, with people and um, that, 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 are, that are not well addressed by, by medicine. I, I hear stories every day that I'm just, I'm like, I can't even believe that aside from, I mean, you know, cancer and, and birth, you know, pediatric cancer and, and birth defects and spinal cord injuries and all this stuff. Like, that's all obvious stuff. But there are other things I, I hear about things. And I'm like, I, I didn't even know that was possible that that could happen to a person. What sort of things do you have in mind? Well, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I was never aware of this. Uh, the, the, there are apparently some nerves in your nose called the turbinates. And uh, it turns out that if you have some kind of a surgery and that could be cosmetic surgery, but it could also be to fix, um, you know, breathing uh, paths and things like that. If the surgeon nicks these turbinates, what happens is that patient 24 seven will feel like they're being suffocated. They're not, but they feel like they're being suffocated. I don't know if you've ever, you know, had, you know, had an experience of somebody choking you or, or, or just try to hold your breath. It, just, just think that that is the rest of your life now, and it cannot be repaired. It, it's just that, that that's it. Like twenty four seven, you feel like you're running out, of, like like you're you're about to die. Like I, I, whoever heard of that? I, I had no idea that this that this was possible. But I've had no numerous people emailing me that this is an issue. Uh, and 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 just just imagine, you know, just from from there, you can you can scale it up to all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, yeah, that's worse than I could have imagined. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just I, I, just just incredible, and I and I see these things every day, and people send me pictures of you know um, various birth defects and abscesses that never heal, and and you know and 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 cancers, and and especially the pediatric stuff is just is just really hard. So so look, uh, the first thing that I think is is super obvious that that I don't think there's any question about is that it isn't a matter of. I mean, you know, oftentimes, oftentimes when people ask about the ethics of this, they have this background assumption that, okay, everything is fine. And that what I want you scientists not to do is to screw it up. So things get worse, right? Like, like, don't screw it up. Don't make scary things that are going to do things worse because everything's cool now. Don't make it worse. That, that is, that is, I, I reject that utterly. Th things are not cool uh, in, in any way. Uh, we, we, we live in a, uh, in a world in which many, many people have a terrible embodied experience. And it is not a matter of just hanging tight because we were somehow created in this natural, optimal way. We, we, we were not. Evolution sort of dropped us off at this, um, we, we, you know, we're, we're susceptible to all kinds of dumb diseases and injuries and things that are completely unnecessary. And, um, and it is our responsibility, those of us who have any ability to, to try to impact this, it is our responsibility to uh, improve the embodied experience of sentient beings. I, I, I believe that very strongly. So, so let's let's start off with that baseline. Is that whatever whatever we're doing, uh, are it is it is not uh, it is not an acceptable. Um, I, I don't think it's an acceptable uh, view that we're just going to leave it alone and try not you know and try not to not to go too far. I'll, I'll say this by the way. I did an informal poll on Twitter once I was asking people, you know, because people say too far. I said, well, what's too, you know, what, what, what kinds of things are too far? And, uh, 6% of the 6% of the responders thought that fire inventing fire was already too far. Like that was already too much. 
You know, I, 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 I propose, well, because, because people say, well, you know, these crazy, but you know, biological robots, that's too far. I'll take my antibiotics and I'll take my heart, you know, my, my, my heart meds and stuff, but, but, you know, biological robots, no, no good. And so I said, okay, fine. You know, you, you're, you're Og, the, the caveman, and, and you've just discovered fire. Um, and you've been given this, this momentary vision of everything that happens after that. So smelting metals, wars, uh, mechanical prosthetics, um, uh, you know, glaucoma surgery, uh, uh, just all of it together, right? And, and, and if you're Og, do you put out the fire and never speak it again? Or having seen what the future looks like, you know, landing on the moon, but also, you know, a nuclear weapon, like the whole thing. Uh, what do you do? Six percent of the people said, having seen it, they would say, "Stay in your wet cave and 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 don't bother with the fire. It's it's not worth it." That's six percent. So so that tells you that tells you that there are widely ranging opinions on this. I I think it's preposterous. Um, uh, and I think we have a an absolute moral imperative to help people. So that's 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 kind of baseline. But now, what do we owe these 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 other creatures? So. The key to all of this, I think, is to develop a framework that goes beyond using similarity of composition and origin as a basis for uh, uh, for morality. We 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 are we we, we as humans, uh, and maybe it's inevitable because of evolution. I'm not sure, but we as humans are very good at picking in groups and out groups and tightening that in group as much as possible. So first of all, just me and maybe my family and my kin, and then maybe people who kind of look like me in various ways, right? And everybody else, whatever, right? That like, that, that's, that's natural, that comes very naturally to us. And um, the kinds of uh, distinctions on which we are willing to base radically different uh, w ways that we're gonna treat each other are minuscule in the grand scheme of things and ridiculous. And we need to really develop frameworks that ask, what what is essential to uh, what what is it that we're really trying to maximize when we're trying to develop an ethics an ethics system right what's the what's the point and I think part of it is is being able to recognize um, uh, other uh, other morally important beings in very novel and embodiments and so I actually like um, there's and and I'm not I'm not strictly speaking a Buddhist but I like the Buddhist version of this which talks about the importance of parallel uh, increases of wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom is the part that lets you actually recognize what's fundamentally important about agents in different guises that you didn't expect before. And by the way, I've done, I've done talks on this stuff to, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, scholars and, um, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist monks and all that. Uh, none of this, whereas a lot of the stuff I say in my talk is pretty shocking to, to most audiences that I talk to. Uh, to them, it's uh, completely obvious. I mean, they're, they're just this is like, yeah, of course we knew that. So, so they have they have this um, uh, kind of uh, built in understanding that uh, when they say uh, compassion, they mean for all sentient beings, and they mean that very widely, right? They're they're sort of past this idea that you have to look like me and have the right kind of you know cortex and and all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I think that's I think that's reasonable, and I think. Um, and for this reason, uh, some of my uh, collaborators at CSAS, which is this uh, uh, center for um, the study of apparent selves, uh, we've written some 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 papers about this on the notion of expanding the uh, the 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 cone of compassion, right? The 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 set of other beings that you are willing to extend your compassion to. And I think, I think that's what I'm developing. And, and, and I'm, I'm in no way, you know, it, it's completely above my pay grade to set up new systems of morality or any of that stuff. All I'm saying is the ones we have now are woefully inadequate and they're not even going to make it. So, so the, the standard uh, systems of, of, of morality and the um, kind of the legal system, uh, the way that we try to binarize this idea of, um, whether somebody had diminished capacity, you know, we're going to be facing humans with expanded capacity. Um, we're going to be looking at, I mean, forget the Twinkie defense, right? Where somebody has a brain tumor or, or some kind of, you know, nutritional thing that screwed up their brain chemistry. We're going to be looking at people who are so non-neurotypical that, you know, this blows that stuff out of the water. And we're going to have to have mature stories to tell about um, what it is that we mean by responsibility, what, what do we owe each other, and, uh, and so on, um, that are completely not captured by the simplistic um, kinds of binary categories that we have today.
But it sounds like even if, if it's above your pay grade to be designing uh, new moral theories or uh, influencing the, the legal system, it sounds like you're pretty convinced that sentience is going to be a big part uh, or a big operating part of these new moral theories when we're it's, trying it, to... It, yeah, it's going to have to be. I don't see any way we survive otherwise. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, from that perspective, just to, just to take a popular culture example, um, if you look at uh, the Star Trek versus Star Wars, for example, right? So, so in Star Trek, uh, if you think about the, you know, the '90s version, was it the Next Generation or whatever? It's supposed to be, I forget what year, you know, 2300 or something like that, right? So, so several centuries into the future. And uh, every other episode, they're still arguing about whether Commander Data is, what, what his status is, right? So, so, so he graduates Starfleet. He's serving alongside them on the, on this, uh, you know, on the Enterprise. Uh, every other episode is some kind of trial, whether they get to take him apart or whether he's a real being or whatever, right? They're still at it. If, if they haven't, if, if we haven't figured this out properly in the, in the next few decades, there's no way we're making it to 2300. I think that's completely ridiculous, and uh, that that they're still wrangling over this. And and the opposite, what I really like, um, is uh, the cantina scene from uh, from from Star Wars, from the original Star Wars, where you know you sort of you pull back and you sort of see every kind of alien, every kind of droid from, from the simple little things that are sort of driving drinks around to the, you know, C-3PO that are, that they're all friends and, and all this, they like, like there you see, it's a, it's a, it's a diverse intelligence has been truly um, incorporated into, into everybody's understanding. It's, it's, it's very clear that your outer outward uh, embodiment doesn't tell the whole story. And, uh, and, and I think if we don't, it's it's central to all the issues. Biomedicine, regenerative medicine is not going to get figured out. AI is not going to get um, resolved. Um, the, the the environmental issues, uh, all the ethical things that are going to come down the pike when people are um, we have hybrid technologies and and also modifications and enhanced technologies. None of this works without advancing the field of diverse intelligence. We we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna make it as a as a species if we don't figure this out. From what you said earlier, uh, self-modeling happens quite low on the cognitive hierarchy. So it's not sufficient for sentient if, say, we can have self-modeling thermostats. Mm -hmm. But what what sort of questions would you be asking about something like an anthrobot or a xenobot or a hybrid to determine whether or not you should have any moral obligation to it? So how would you ask whether it's capable of any degree of subjective experience how might you investigate this yeah um i think that uh, well there there are two two issues here one is that uh w- w- you you asked about which of the things to 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 um to whom we have moral obligations so again i think the issue is uh there that it's not a binary thing and we already, I mean, let, let's 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 face it. Uh, yeah, people people um, will often uh, complain uh, that uh, you know you should you should be nicer to these uh, z- you know xenobots and um, uh, you know and not do experiments on them. Well, maybe, but but let's tackle factory farming of mammals first, right? Like we we are already wildly inconsistent with how we handle this. We we know for a fact that pigs are smart. We know for a fact that they can suffer like us. Um, why do we still have you know, why do we still have factory farming it's 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 i think it's you know it's 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 outrageous but 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 the, most of the people who who will who will write to me about uh so, you know frog skin derived biobots are not vegetarians they haven't uh, spent any time boycotting uh, you know the factory farming system so so we we're already wildly inconsistent as a society about how how we treat various beings so I, i'm i'm not naive in thinking that once we understand that uh mind uh, spreads widely we're suddenly going to be um uh, re- uh behave appropriately towards towards all of its uh kind of instances um we still have a lot a lot of work to do but but it's a, but it's a critical start and i think if it's not binary the point is there's going to be some proportionality to it so you know uh 
do I, you know, do I think that um, simple kinds of uh, living things uh, have a have a uh, a primary internal um, perspective and experience? Yes, I do. But in deciding whether you know whether it's okay to um, uh, harvest some plants to to eat or or or, or whatever, you we're going to have to for for now anyway. We're going to have to make some hard choices. In other words, um, you. Uh, probably a practical version of doing it scales your level of concern to the capacity of the system to have an internal perspective and to suffer. So it's not a binary yes or no. I mean, we know it's not a binary yes or no because of our food chain and so on, right? So there's going to be some kind of, um, there's going to be some kind of proportional, um, proportional response. Um, the, uh, the experiments that we do are going to be exactly the kinds of things that behavioral and cognitive science has done for many years. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of debates about insects and whether or not um, insects can feel pain. And, uh, and, and people do experiments in that, in, in that, uh, in that uh, area. And then so some people have, have raised that issue for, for plants and so on. Uh, th th that's, that, that, those are exactly the kinds of experiments that we need to do extended to other problem spaces. It's not just whether you can move away. I mean, like a lot of the older um, attempts at these uh, at, at, at making these judgments with the protocols were like, well, does it, does it move away from a noxious stimulus? Well, again, moving in three-dimensional space is one thing, moving in physiological space is something else. Having goals, being able to navigate another problem space and um, having uh, the intelligence to be able to handle novel circumstances, to have strong preferences about what happens and, and to really strive for certain outcomes at the expense of other outcomes. Those are all signatures of, um, of sentience and in the, uh, and, 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 um, and by implication, more moral worth. And, you know, we're going to have to, let's, let's face it. We, we, we're so bad at it. There are, there are plenty of stories out there uh, of, uh, people whose skin is a particular color not getting analgesics in, in medical practice sufficiently because there was this thought, I don't know who came up with this, but there was this idea that for some reason they have a higher pain tolerance. Uh, you know, if you can do that, then the right, or, or I'm told that even today that um, in, in a lot of sp specific procedures, women are not given, you know, enough, um, uh, enough pain management meds and so on. You can, you can read about stories like that. So we are, it's 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 very easy for us apparently to downplay the capacity of others to suffer when those differences are tiny, right? Imagine imagine how bad it would be that that that's the kind of you know that we we we're we're apparently make those kind of mistakes based on uh, skin color and 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 sex you know sex characteristics. Imagine imagine how bad we're going to be when when something really doesn't look like us and really had a different origin story. So that that's the sort of thing I think we should we should be working hard to avoid. Hmm. The baseline, as you put it, so maybe your your first axiom uh, is that we have a moral imperative to help people hmm. and. I'm wondering then if the implication is that this provides sort of like a, a prima facie motivation for doing this sort of work. And then the reference to factory farming suggests that even if somewhere on the spectrum, there is a moral infringement on the rights of anthrobots or xenobots or hybrots, it's far less significant than the suffering we might be averting elsewhere in the biomedical realm by developing this technology yeah um this is something this is something that um i wrestled with a lot uh, when i was younger uh you know do, doing experiments uh in biology m means that you're going to be perturbing living systems right at different scales that's just what it means and so the question is do we think that the um the eventual outcome is worth it uh in in the cases that I'm involved in, I've decided that yes, it's absolutely it's absolutely worth it. And uh, people, you know, I get I, I I get emails and phone calls from people in in various um, who have made various other uh, decisions. So so for example, uh, some people uh, will call and say, um, "How dare you do experiments in frogs?" And my guess is that the vast majority of people of these people. Uh, 
if if they were sick or if their kids were sick would immediately head to the hospital and hope that somebody had figured things out i usually i usually tell these people to to go down to the pediatric oncology ward in their in their uh, big in their neighboring city and spend but probably doesn't take more than 20 minutes of that before before you uh uh you know stop writing letters like that but um uh i met uh, i've only met one person that i truly believed that when she said, uh, you know, she she w would not, she she didn't want me to um, do or anybody in the scientific community to do experiments with uh, with with biological beings, and she would not take her child to the doctor if they needed it. I I, be I believe her, and I think she was a monster. And uh, what can I say? Uh, you know, to 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 me the um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the potential good, um, d d you know, definitely outweighs it. Um, and then, and then you've got the other people, then you've got the other people that, um, that, uh, contact me and say, hurry up. Like, what's taking you so long? Why, why is it that, you know, my, 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 um, whoever has, has whatever condition, how, how is it that, that we still don't have the solve? Like what's, what, what, you know, what are you doing? Like get, get, get to work. And, uh, and so there are, you know, many varied opinions along, along that axis, but I would think that the vast majority of uh, folks would would support support ethical research, understanding the uh, the incredible pressing need for um, uh, in the in the medical field, not not just for humans, but for animals as well. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, there are plenty of things that I I had hoped to cover, so I wanted to talk about poly computing and bioelectric networks and the future of regenerative medicine and your work toward regenerative medicine. But I think that rather than trying to cover those topics in four or five minutes, I should save them for sure. another time and sure. just end by thanking you again for uh, a wonderful and really eye-opening conversation. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always fun. Yeah. Happy to, happy to talk again. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you.